Welcome to Real World Perspectives on Poverty Solutions. I'm Trevor Bechtel, facilitator of this series with Poverty Solutions at the University of Michigan and instructor of the course that accompanies this lecture series. Over the next seven weeks, we'll introduce key issues regarding the causes and consequences of poverty in this virtual space, featuring experts in policy and practice from across the nation. So we are an audience of students enrolled in a course, of community members, academics, policymakers, and interested people from Southeast Michigan and beyond. And we are really excited about today's session with Fred Weary, co-author of Credit Where It's Due, Rethinking Financial Citizenship with our moderator, Kristen Seafelt. But before we dig into this conversation, I want to remind our viewers that we want to hear from you. You can submit questions in the comment box to the right on YouTube, or on Twitter using the hashtag Poverty Solutions. We have several questions from students um, that, we, that we'll feature, and we'll also, we're also excited about the live dialogue. We look forward to meaningful conversation and we'll try to get to as many of our questions as possible. I want you to also know that we'll be responsive to any inappropriate content. I invite you to check out our resources to tune in for additional events and find other ways to connect with poverty research at our website, poverty.umich.edu. So with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Kristen Seafelt, the Associate Director for Educational Programs at Poverty Solutions, who will introduce our speaker. Thanks so much, Trevor. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome both um, my co-author on Credit Where It's Due from the Russell Sage Foundation, but also my friend, uh, Fred Wary. Fred is a Townsend Martin Class of 1917 Professor of Sociology at Princeton University, and he's also the Director of the Dignity and Debt Network, a partnership between the Social Science Research Council and Princeton. He's the editor of the Oxford Handbook on Consumption and the four volume Sage Encyclopedia of Economics and Society, as well as Money Talks, How Money Really Works. He edits a book series at Stanford University Press called Culture and Economic Life. And he was recently in 2018, president of the Social Science History Association. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to you, Fred, and welcome uh, to the Poverty Solutions Speaker Series. Thanks so much, Kristen, um, and such a pleasure to be back uh, at Michigan, uh, where I taught for a number of years. Um, I miss you guys. So um, I guess it's time now uh, for the show. So uh, today I'm going to talk about the, the weight of debt. Uh, and I'll start by talking about the weight of debt in ways that we typically think about um, how it weighs um, on US households. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the weight of debt in ways that we don't uh, talk about uh, enough. <clears throat> and when I'm thinking about um, uh, what I mean here, uh, let's just uh, consider just a few facts. Um, so the quantitative weights are pretty uh, well known. Um, and we know that uh, consumer debts are, are large and have been on the rise. Uh, we uh, know that after uh, uh, accounting for mortgages, uh, it's the student loan debts that are um, sort of the largest, taking up the largest share of household debts. Um, affecting 44.2 million borrowers. It's even greater than auto loans, uh, which are still pretty high, um, or a credit card debt. Uh, and so we are, I mean, we're very good at thinking about uh, uh, the quantitative weights in that way. <clears throat> the other thing that we uh, know is that the quantitative uh, uh, weights um, have to be uh, considered alongside uh, how those quantitative weights cross the color line. Uh, and so here, uh, our team at, with the Dignity and Debt Network um, uh, has, um, <clears throat> has used the style of data visualization um, pioneered uh, by W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, 
in order just to show how the weight of debt has increased across the color line. And so we show here some renderings in which we see uh, white students on average graduating uh, with 16,000, uh, whereas black students are graduating with 23,000 in debt. Uh, within five years, that goes up to 25,000 for the uh, white students, but 53,000 for the black students. Uh, and there are a number of scholars who have run these estimates and similar estimates, um, uh, including Otto and Hul and Simon and, and others. Um, and you can go to our website and look at some of these renderings um, with the source citations attached. The, <clears throat> in addition to uh, sort of thinking about how um, it has uh, uh, crossed the cuddle line, um, we want to think more about uh, how consumers start feeling that weight. Um, and in order to do this, I brought on some visual artists to our Dignity and Debt Network um, and asked them to look at some of the work by Jacob Lawrence uh, and then to read some reports that were coming out of Pew Charitables Trust, uh, National Consumer Law Center, ACLU, and elsewhere that describes what happens uh, when debtors are falling uh, behind. Um, I also shared with them some of the work that Kristen Seafelt here at Michigan and Anthony Alvarez and I did on how people experience debt and credit. And what I'm showing you today is why we should expect the weight of debt to vary even when the quantitative amount of that debt is the same. And we're going to see this variation manifest itself at the moment uh, when debts are being collected by a collector. It's one of the uh, it's one thing to have lots of debt that you worry about, um, uh, but are not yet top of mind. And it's quite another thing to have debt collectors trying to trace where you are, calling incessantly, and calling others in your personal and professional network to force you into uh, repayment. It's... Um, and it's one thing when you're carrying that debt alone. Um, uh, it's also uh, very different um, when you have to force that debt onto the backs of people you care about, um, either intimately or professionally. And so in the late 1970s, uh, Representative uh, Millicent Fenwick, who ended up being a four-term Republican member of the United States House of Representatives from New Jersey, had this to say about uh, debt collection. She talked about a case uh, in which uh, there was this uh, female debtor, uh, the debt collector calls and threatens her um, and says that he would uh, let the woman's husband's employer know that she was basically a deadbeat. When she replied that her husband uh, was an attorney and was his own boss, uh, the debt collector did not give up. He simply went after her husband's best client. And these are the kinds of relational damages, I think, that help fuel the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Um, yet we see a different version of this behavior, even though some of it's uh, 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 technically against the law, we see a different version of this behavior happening uh, still. Now, we know that uh, debtors will sometimes volunteer others in their social networks um, to guarantee their loans. Um, we also see how tenants and Matt Desmond's work on eviction can sometimes burn their social ties strategically in order to try to stay housed. And what we are not focused on enough, I think, is how debt collectors can go after a debtor's social ties without the consent of the debtor um, or of the targeted tie and can dispose of those much uh, needed uh, relationships. Now the relational damages are, are, that are happening um, are both embedded and they're also arm's length. And, and by embedded, we, we're making a, a general distinction uh, about sort of those intimate ties that we have with parents, siblings, or close friends and arm's length here, we're largely talking about employers. Um, now, keep in mind that the debtor relies uh, heavily on both sets of ties for a range of uh, favors and resources. Um, 
Uh, and so when those uh, ties are damaged, um, uh, they, are, they have a significant effect. Um, <clears throat> also keep in mind that sometimes the embedded tie is a cosigner for the loan, but at other times, um, family members will say that they are not cosigners and therefore should not be responsible for or be embarrassed or harassed by something that their relative did. Um, now for arm's length ties, we will only talk today about bosses and coworkers um, or other professional re relations who are not party to the contract. Um, and, and so, and this is work that I'm uh, uh, doing now with uh, graduate student Parijat Chakrabarti, Isabel Gijon, who was a postdoc here with us, um, and Katie Donnelly, another uh, graduate student. Um, so uh, let me just give, uh, say a few words about how we're doing that work um, and what we're uh, finding in it. Um, now, <clears throat> we uh, went to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's uh, complaints database. Uh, uh, and because we have so much time on our hands, we decided just to download the, there were over 25,000 at the time, uh, federal student loan complaints um, that were submitted between March of 2015 and January 2018. And out of those, there were over 7,000 that had narratives. And so we focus on the, the narratives in the three big uh, complaint clusters. And those complaint clusters were people basically writing in and asking for flexible payment options and saying, you know, can you please work with me? I know I owe money, but I can't pay what you're asking me to pay per month. Um, there were people who were having other trouble managing their payments and needing some kind of um, uh, relief, um, maybe a break. Um, and there uh, were people who simply disagreed with some of the fees uh, that, uh, that they um, uh, were being asked to pay. And they were saying that, that there were fees added to the account and, and there were some other problems with paperwork and they weren't quite sure what was going on. Um, now, uh, we then, uh, out of this 4,400 set, uh, we took a subsample of over 500 complaints for sort of a really close reading. And, and the way we sorted through that initial set of 7,000 is we just used some structural topic modeling to just do initial, some initial clustering and then we had to start reading. Um, it took quite a lot of time. Uh, now, keep in mind that uh, we are using these uh, consumer complaints from the CFPB, but in no way should you see these complaints as being representative um, of a uh, population of complaints. Um, we are uh, thinking about this instead um, in the way that you might think about um, uh, uh, a set of qualitative interviews. Um, and so uh, here, you'll see that um, uh, we capture uh, some of the expressions about uh, debt, um, about the weight of debt that go well beyond um, whether or not the money is owed or uh, whether the terms of the contract were violated. Um, and so this makes uh, the set of data function for us as uh, strategic uh, research uh, materials. Now, I ask that you treat these complaints in the way that you would con a convenient sample of qualitative interviews, uh, because here what we're going to see are some practical understandings about debt um, and its damages. And in some cases, we're going to see some post hoc justifications for how people fell so deep into debt and why they need help getting out. We also, uh, you know, as a way of uh, trying to make sure that we weren't um, uh, telling ourselves stories that, uh, that are only based on people who didn't get relief um, or uh, only telling stories from people who did get some form of relief, uh, we, we did random draws with one set of complaints where people actually got some form of relief from, uh, by virtue of complaining about um, uh, how they were being treated. And we also drew a random set from um, people who 
uh, did not receive any relief. They simply received a letter that, you know, um, there is no indication of wrongdoing and the complaint is closed. Now, I'm going to start by just giving some examples uh, from the embedded relations that, that get damaged. Um, and I think that once you see a couple of those examples, you'll see why we uh, should care about them. Um, now, in this first one, uh, we see an uncle uh, who now refuses to speak to the debtor uh, because he hates the situation that his nephew has put him in. The uncle's retired, um, is trying to live the best he can um, as a retiree, um, and uh, now he's getting lots of phone calls, um, is feeling harassed, uh, and can and just can't do anything. And so the uncle who used to help him um, on a for for a number of uh, issues now offers no help at all. The next uh, one that we'll take a quick look at um, is uh, a relational damage um, that happens to um, a person's brother. And the, the complaint reads, they went so far as to call my brother inquiring on my whereabouts and asking him if he's able to assist in paying my debt and my brother is not even a co-signer on the loan. Um, now, to, today, they're also using some scare tactics with my father. And my only request here is that they stop uh, making phone calls to parties who are not involved in the creditor relationship. Um, and so uh, what I, the, the one I just read to you is not exactly the one that you're seeing on your slide, because um, I'm on slide 18. Um, uh, but uh, that's more than fine. I, I'm sure that my voice uh, carries. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is start looking at the arm's length relationships. Um, and, <clears throat> and I think the first one that we want to look at is um, the talk that some people are having um, from their bosses. So in one of the typical complaints in this area, uh, the person says that their boss has had to have several talks with them um, because she asked that the debt collector stop calling the place of employment and they keep calling. Uh, this other person uh, is, seems to be really embarrassed uh, because the phone rings at work. Uh, one of the coworkers answers the phone and the first thing they hear is, we know she's there put her on the phone. Um, and the manager has told me to make them stop. Uh, and sometimes they call it the five times a day. Um, and as this person is describing what's happening at work, they're also uh, adding in that their mom is being called too, and is sometimes in tears, and is being treated very badly and berated for having uh, no money. And one of the most surprising ones, uh, there is a discussion of uh, someone who is getting phone calls about a student loan with Wells Fargo. Um, they are constantly calling and harassing the co-signer, but somehow they manage to get their boss's personal cell phone number and they don't even know how they got, um, the collector got the boss's personal cell phone number. Um, and so, if you can imagine someone who is already um, feeling um, economically vulnerable, um, and, and they but they still have managed to secure employment, uh, they now feel that their employment um, is uh, somehow um, uh, under threat. And so, no matter uh, how much these debtors owe, uh, one of the things that they're indicating even as they talk about these, um, what they feel to be abuses of important relationships to them, is that they want to be treated as if they are worthy uh, for respect. Um, 
And so here uh, we see a, a pretty sad um, description um, of uh, a mother uh, who notes that it's one thing to be berated by a debt collector. Um, it's quite another thing when the phone is on speaker. Um, uh, you've only called them on speaker because they've told you that your house is going to be padlocked and the sheriff is going to be there to, to take you away. Um, uh, and your child is sitting in the next uh, seat and she hears this man uh, using profanity, calling her mother a loser and starts crying and saying, you know, why is this man calling you a loser, uh, mommy? And what we hear time and again um, in these uh, complaints is a sense that people are being made to feel as if they are somehow financially incompetent, irresponsible, and negligent. And when they're talking about these feelings of um, uh, uh, being degraded, um, they are experiencing a dignity deficit. Um, and here I'm going to use Anthony Apaya to go beyond our a general sense of being treated as, as if you have self-worth or not being treated as if you have self-worth. And we're going to see what it means to be treated as if you are fully seen, um, as if an appropriate weight is being placed on rele relevant facts about you. Um, so when I was growing up in South Carolina, uh, this was something that was drilled into me at an early age. Um, you know, I would hear, uh, you know that child is sensitive, so you can't speak to him like that. Or um, speak up, you know Mr. Frank can't hear like other people. Or uh, you can't, can't you just see how, how he walks? He can't walk that fast. He can't walk as fast as you can. You need to slow down, you have to help him. He has a cane. Um, and this is what we might think about as recognition uh, respect, because uh, it's something, uh, but it's something that debtors themselves do not experience. They are not treated as if uh, their demonstrated capacity uh, for repayment is relevant to the conversations they are having with debt collectors. Instead, they are treated as if they should be able to just meet their obligations, regardless of their capacities or how those obligations are imposed on them in the first place. Now, what Kristen Seafelt, Anthony Alvarez, and I found when we we're writing Credit Where It's Due is that people um, who are trying to acquire a more secure place in the financial uh, system are also trying to protect their sense of honor. And in the moments when they are using debt to help them make an investment in themselves or in their children, they don't want to be treated as if they never intended uh, to pay their loans back or on time, or to be treated like, you know, they're they're thieves or or liars. Um, and so, beyond the quantitative amount they owe, debtors express that they should not be harassed or disrespected or forced to engage uh, with really uh, vile uh, characters. Um, so just this week, uh, think about um, uh, sort of the problems of debt. And, and as we've seen um, how these problems have been expressed um, in the Consumer Financial Protection uh, Bureau's uh, public uh, complaints database, uh, we also want to think about um, how few infrastructures there are for repair. And those infrastructures that exist uh, were not built with debtors um, in mind. So take, for instance, the courts. Um, um, Erica Ricard and her team at Pew Charitable's Trust put out a report in June about how debt collectors are transforming state courts, reminding us that in 90% of the cases that make it to court, uh, the defendant debtor does not have an attorney, um, and the court um, issued default judgments against the debtors in about 70% of the cases. Um, now, uh, as we were uh, thinking through these problems of um, what's happening with debt collection, and, and some of this um, uh, was sort of brought uh, uh, into clear relief uh, uh, early in the year, right before the shutdown um, at the um, Aspen Institute's uh, 
a debt collector refinery where um, uh, one of uh, from Michigan was JJ um, and others were were there. Um, and, and there uh, we started thinking about, and I and I, I started sort of asking the question, what would happen if we actually had trackers um, so that we could see. Uh, who's falling into debt, um, exactly where they are um, in terms of neighborhood characteristics um, and who's being called to court. Um, and if we could see it in real time so that we could identify where spikes are happening, if spikes are localized um, and uh, provided in a, in a format that might be useful uh, to uh, uh, consumer advocates. So I, I also then teamed up with uh, Lois Lupica, uh, Dali Jimenez, and Robin Lee. And Robin Lee's a PhD student. Both Lois and, and Dali are um, law professors. Um, and we've called in the January Advisors Data Science Group in order to sort of build out um, this uh, new data infrastructure and these new trackers so that we can look at spikes and look at some baseline uh, work. Uh, that's only just starting. The other thing that we're doing is we are uh, running a, um, uh, putting together a new uh, uh, debt collector series modeled on Jacob Lawrence's migration series. Um, and what we're hoping will happen is that we can somehow pull together um, these visual representations uh, of the weight of debt um, and the dignity of debtors alongside um, uh, really current um, and actionable uh, uh, data. The other thing that we are doing um, uh, is uh, uh, through the Dignity and Debt Network, um, uh, we're working with partners around the globe um, who are uh, concerned with how consumers are experiencing the financial uh, sector and various financial services. And here I just um, offer up some examples from a project uh, in uh, Kenya um, run by a, 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 a data science group called City Beats there out of Barcelona. And so you can imagine the, the fun of coordinating with uh, Barcelona uh, and Nairobi um, and, and hopping into uh, Nairobi with one of my graduate students, um, uh, Parijat uh, Chakrabarti, uh, and, and uh, using um, uh, social media platforms uh, where uh, uh, citizens in Kenya were tagging um, different financial service providers and talking about problems happening in that sector. Um, and uh, what we were able to put together with financial sector Jeep in Kenya was a, just a monitoring system, a way of seeing um, spikes in particular types of complaints. Um, and so, so that's been the sort of the first cut of this. And, and what it's done is it's helped people at the central bank identify problems in real time. Um, uh, and so it doesn't tell them what to do, but it's but it does assist in saying there may be a problem over here or over there, and you don't need to wait um, six to nine months to figure out from old data that there's a problem. Um, uh, we are now working with City Beats uh, and the Center for Technology Internet Policy at the uh, Policy School at Princeton uh, to think about. Um, can we develop other trackers using uh, various uh, social media platforms uh, so that we can see positive or negative dignity spiking up or down, so where we can see empowerment going up or down, and where we can see that happening in real time, um, both uh, with financial inclusion, but also um, more generally in civil uh, society. And I'll simply conclude uh, with um, a quick note uh, of uh, where you can find some of the work that we're doing uh, to the extent that, that we have it now publicly facing, uh, dignityanddebt.org. Uh, um, and the simple uh, mission of the Dignity and Debt Network um, uh, that I founded a, a few years ago is simply to say, you know, we use debt for lots of things. Um, and is it possible uh, to imagine someone carrying debt, um, but doing it with a sense of dignity, a sense of um, self-worth, uh, and feeling as if uh, their best efforts uh, will be somehow respected? Um, and so with that, 
uh, let's uh, turn to uh, uh, questions and answers and general discussion. So I'm hopping on here. I think that Kristen has frozen. Um, one of the things that we realize is that our mother's advice when we were young to um, to always smile, um, in case we froze like that, uh, it has some actual reality in this space. So I want to start um, with a question here uh, from Lorne. Are certain are there certain debt collectors that receive high numbers of complaints or use, especially regarding um, collection or degrading collection ta tactics. So what could motivate them to change their practices? Yeah, so uh, so there's uh, one good resource for thinking about uh, who's bringing uh, the uh, cases to court. Um, the National Consumer uh, Law Center um, will tell you who are the top three uh, debt collectors um, uh, who are the, uh, or the top three plaintiffs per state. Uh, sometimes you'll find surprising um, who shows up on that list. Um, uh, but what what we don't uh, see as much is um, a, 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 that attention to the degrading uh, tactics, particularly those degrading tactics that may or may not rise to the level of um, uh, legal infringement. Um, uh, for that reason, we're working on these um, uh, dignity detectors um, using machine learning um, so that we can um, perhaps uh, go to a large uh, state to start with um, and and sort of go through and, and, and detect where you're seeing um, attacks on empowerment and on dignity um, and whether or not those are sort of matched up uh, with other uh, actionable or non-actionable infringements, and so that's some that's work that that still has has to be done. Um, in terms of uh, motivations to change practices, so I think uh, one of the things that we should keep in mind is that uh, the debt collectors are there because uh, there's a market for them. Um, there are people who can't pay their debts, um, and that those debts get sold for pennies on the dollar. Um, and they make something from it. Now, one of the things that uh, that people typically assume is that the only way that you're going to get people to sort of pay what they owe is to um, uh, engage with them really aggressively. And apparently, that sometimes uh, uh, works. Um, now, there are some, but you know, this has to be tested and tested again. Uh, indications that uh, you know a really aggressive move will work for someone who is not a chronic debtor, uh, right? So uh, you know you. So I'll use myself as an example. Uh, once I was in the middle of of moving house, um, there was so much else going on with uh, you know a, a sick parent, et cetera, et cetera. I completely forgot to pay some bills. Uh, now I wasn't turned over to a debt collector, but I got a fine and I got some other things I was able to call and say look I've got stuff going on really sorry I make mean, the you know you see the stern letter plus a uh, plus a fine like this isn't who I am um, and they said oh you know we can make an exception in this case because you've got such a nice record but it was that stern note that told me like oh my god uh, you know sh shake out of it clear your inbox pay I mean you it's not that I didn't have the money to pay it now now, when you talk to people who have chronic debts and they're not quite sure what to do next, um, and I've done, and I, I don't have, uh, I, this, I can't make this as a generalizable statement. I can simply say this is what we're seeing um, in some of the complaints data and also in some, uh, I've started some interviewing uh, work. Um, what you find is that what people are saying is, you know, I just get demobilized. I just can't even do the simple things that I need to do um, because of the way they're coming at me. Um, and it's so disrespectful because they act as if you never ever meant to pay. Like, like you're not, like you're just a thief. 
and like you're not an honest person. I just don't want to deal with them. Um, and so part of it is, um, is there a way that you can get engagement and attention, uh, but also have um, the debtors uh, want to deal uh, with uh, the people who are on the on the call with them? And so, so that's so that is an open question. That's a testable question. Um, and those are questions that are being tested in various um, uh, arenas, um, but but we we don't yet have definitive answers there. That's great, thank you. I'm I'm going to just go ahead and ask a question myself. Um, and so I, I was really interested in the um, visual artists that you brought in to kind of explore this. And one of the things that I often find with this kind of data is that when I see a chart or a graph, it often really helps me to kind of understand the data. Sometimes those can be incredibly powerful. Um, and I also I also kind of experienced that with the images that you showed um, and, and found them powerful. So I would be interested in, in hearing you just talk a little bit more about, about that kind of connection, um, particularly in terms of how um, we as embodied humans ap approach data. Um, um, so, oh yes. Yeah. So, um, uh, one of the challenges, particularly when you when someone hears the word debt, um, is that you know most people don't want to hear a sad story. Um, most of us are looking for something that is uplifting, um, and it also sounds like something you can't do anything about anyway. Um, and so, what we uh, what I've tried to do is so I've reached out to our uh, to our Lewis Center for the Arts over the over the summer, and I said, um, I want this thing done. Um, I really like Jacob Lawrence, so I want it done in the style of Lawrence. Um, can you send out this request uh, to all of your art students? Um, and 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 a number of art students sent me their portfolios electronically. Um, and uh, thankfully, um, you know, I, I, I had enough budget to sort of and budget and attention to bring two in um, who have worked really well together. And so, um, so one of the things that, that we are trying to figure out is how do you tell um, an anchoring story? Uh, because the way stories anchor us um, into a reality is they basically will tell you who the protagonist is. Um, they will offer up um, some pathways of remedy. Um, and sometimes there will be pathways that we uh, did not consider as possible pathways um, before hearing the story. And so part of what, what, we're, what I think art can do um, is uh, create space um, for rethinking pathways. Because uh, otherwise we just get stuck in, uh, this is what the data table tells us, um, it's really bad. Um, and this is how we typically deal with things that are this bad. So we're gonna have to find other ways to deal with things that are this bad. I think the last thing I'll say on this is um, my ambition for the project uh, uh, is um, that we will somehow be able to embed both um, the sort of uh, basic uh, sort of data table type um, uh, renderings um, within the artwork um, and that we'll also be able to sort of create a more um, um, a dynamic way of bringing the voices from the complaints and the voices from consumers into the artwork and so that so that there are ways and uh, we're not quite sure how we're gonna do it but we're working with the great team um, called hyper object uh, on sort of how do you sort of uh, both bring things together and then break them all apart and then reassemble. Um, and so, uh, so we're working with them right now on how we're going to do this. Sounds great. I'll turn the moderation back over to Kristen. And Kristen, you're muted. Thanks for jumping in, Trevor. Um, Fred, we have a question from Alexandra, and she wants to know, have there been any moves uh, made to introduce federal policy that would reduce some of the dehumanizing practices that you talked about? Uh, yes. So um, uh, states are better than, than the feds on, on this. Um, and so uh, one place that I'll, that, so I think the, the, the best resources out there are um, uh, Pew and the and NCLC, um, uh, and so and they have pointed out some innovations out of Colorado and elsewhere where they are, you know, they're um, they're going beyond um, what the federal guidelines are, um, 
and, and trying to sort of um, generate um, uh, a, a sort of a more humane uh, um, terrain for um, for debtors, uh, but they're trying to do it in a way that um, that debts still get paid, right? And so, what we don't want to do is say there's a lot of bad stuff happening out there, um, and so we put the kibosh on everything, and then suddenly people can't get loans uh, that are that are much needed. Um, and so, uh, so part of it is trying to strike that balance. Um, and also trying to take advantage of the fact that we are a federal um, system uh, so that we can take advantage of federalism to um, launch some experiments um, and how to do it better. Um, and then how then to scale out from those experiments. Uh, so, so, that's, so that is a partial uh, answer. Um, and the other thing too is that um, the, and I and and I am guilty of this myself. So one of the things that we don't understand well enough um, is sort of the the range of debt collectors and debt collecting practices that are out there. Um, and I say that I am guilty of this as, as well as because when um, Chris and you and I were working on um, credit where it's due, we asked people about um, the various financial services uh, that they engaged in. And sometimes people would say, uh, we would say, you know, isn't that a debt, debt, uh, uh, um, a payday lender uh, that, that you're describing there? No, like, no, it's not like one of the bad ones, right? And so they are consumers are pretty savvy, and they have a way of understanding, um, even in a, um, a stigmatized profession, uh, that there is a range of behaviors that are happening there. Um, and they'll say, you know, there's some who aren't that aren't so bad. There's some who are kind of awful. Um, and, and they would do this in a way also to sort of tell us, look, I am not incompetent. Uh, I am not um, uh, somehow uh, 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 financially ignorant. I know this is these things are, are things that I should try to avoid. Um, but given my circumstances, I'm at least going to some of the better options that are out there. And so, so one of the the things that we're going to need to get better about is trying to understand how the Good actors um, in, uh, in in collections, how they're doing their work, um, and, and how we can make a business case for um, uh, for sort of uh, engaging in better practices. Um, so I'll I'll leave it there for now. But like I, I have other ideas about sort of um, one of the things that regulation uh, do is they basically say there's some things that you just can't do because they're just flat out wrong. Um, uh, and then the other thing that we want to do is we want to say um, uh, there are some things that that we should sort of uh, ask, um, can we innovate here um, so that everybody's better off? Because um, if you're a debtor, you know, OK, I owe a lot of money. Um, I want I actually want to pay it. Um, I just can't do it. Uh, is there is there a better way for us to engage? Because you're trying to squeeze um, uh, sort of blood out of, out of a rock. Yeah. So, sort of building off of of this discussion, um, Brian asks, like, you know, if we can make some of these these changes, like, how would you police it? And you know, yeah. Brian points out, like, it seems like some of the tactics that are being used are are sort of like blackmail. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about some of the tracking and how you see that yeah. as playing a role. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think. Um, one of so if consumers were uh, were more empowered and um, and actually uh, were told that their uh, situations uh, do not um, mean that they are somehow morally deficient, um, uh, they might, uh, with a little bit more uh, affirmation, uh, be willing uh, to flag problems as they occur. Right, so. If you are in a situation where you think, if I flag a problem, it's not going to do anything, and I'm just going to be humiliated all over again, then you're, you're not going to bother. And so part of it is, how do we turn to civil society um, and uh, to, a, to uh, see debtors in a new way? Um, because if uh, we think about uh, the abuses uh, that happen to debtors as a human rights issue, and as a fundamental human rights issue, then the debtors are not alone. And so they're going to be encouraged and it's going to be normalized that um, they have moral worth um, and that when these things happen to them, not only should they be complaining, but we should all be uh, complaining. 
um, and uh, to the extent that there is sunlight so that we can see who the debtors are, uh, who the debt collectors are, um, and we can see uh, where they're practicing. Um, uh, to the extent that there's sunlight, um, there may be a more like a higher likelihood of disinfectant. Um, so that's the it's, it doesn't fix everything, um, but it does make it a, a hell of a lot better. Um, so that's the that's the partial answer. Um, so Matt Sullivan has a, a question about the efficacy of some of these collection me methods. Like, is it really? I mean, do we know if certain tactics work better than others or is this really just about a lot of strong arming to get blood out of a stone yeah. like you, yeah. you know so uh so one of the, the the areas where i uh uh look to is there's a a, a nice paper uh, uh that's called um uh what's it called uh the, the behavioral uh scientist as tax collector um and so, uh, and, and I'm so glad Matt uh, uh, asked that question and I haven't seen Matt in a couple of years, but that's okay. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, and one of the reasons that they posed it as a behavioral uh, question is they noted that when they looked at people who were behind in paying um, their, uh, their city taxes, um, and they looked at the letters that were being sent out uh, to those folks, um, there was no sort of, the, there was it was pretty punitive and it was uh and 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 it wasn't uh, uh uh generating the results that the tax collectors wanted um when they changed those letters and and, and did a randomization changed them emphasized um a sort of the sense of um you know it's pretty you know it's pretty normal that some people fall behind and can't pay all of their taxes on time that's a, that happens in, to a lot of people um and they, you know, and change it to be both normative, but also an emphasis on, you know, but we have a moral obligation and, and, and you know, and this happens, and this happens a lot. Um, and so to the extent that it becomes normative um, and that the actor is seen as a, a moral actor, uh, the, the number of people who are responding to those letters uh, with re repayment plans, et cetera, went, went up. Um, and so part of, uh, of what we're seeing is, um, there are ways in which uh, people are encountering uh, the calls to uh, rectify uh, um, uh, debts that are in arrears. There are ways that those encounters happen that can be uh, demobilizing, and those are typically the ways that that are, are used now. Um, and there are other ways that you can do it that are sort of a simplified um, uh, uh, messaging um, a, a more normalized um, and moral framing um, and thinking about a person's moral worth uh, that seems to have a better outcome. Um, uh, now, for some reason, even when you present this this kind of evidence uh, to people who need it most um, and who would benefit most from it, it's hard for it to land uh, because as far as some of them are concerned, you know, no matter what you do, I've been in this business for a while, uh, I don't know that they're going to do anything. So let's just let a third party come in um, and collect the debts because we just can't do it. Um, so, so, so this is, I think, where um, having uh, more awareness and more sort of civil society awareness um, and support, I think it makes it easier uh, for people to take up these uh, new, new proposals. It is such a hidden industry in, in many ways. And um, a question from from Rizki, uh, sort of along the, these, you know, picking up on this this thread of, of moral and ethics. Um, Rizki asks: Are federal regulations on debt collection ethics lacking, or is this an issue of enforcement of the rules? And did you see any patterns in terms of the way that that different collectors were operating? Yeah. So I mean, some of it is an issue of. Uh, of what the rules are um, and for whom the rules were written. Uh, and so and so that is something that we that we have to keep in mind. Um, now there are protections there, um, but uh, there have been some work done, um, uh, April Kuhnhoff and others, uh, uh, where they sort of demonstrate the extent to which the the, the rules that exist are, are, are inadequate. Um, and the way that those rules are, have have been recently proposed for rewriting uh, 
uh, will make it even worse uh, for debtors. Um, and so, so one of the challenges here is that uh, uh, it it's not something that uh, that that offers up a winning message uh, and for a, a political campaign. So, so you know, sort of going forward and saying, oh, there are lots of people whose debts are so bad. Uh, that they're being called at home at work and people who didn't even sign up for this are getting called. Um, and we need to make sure that they're protected. And what typically happens um, in those kinds of conversations is people kind of say, well, what about me? Um, because I'm, I'm struggling and suffering and barely keeping up with my debts. And so it becomes kind of a zero sum uh, competition uh, for um, sort of a recognition that, you know, if they're worth your attention, why aren't we worth attention? Um, those of us who uh, continue to struggle and suffer, but somehow keep ourselves afloat. Um, so, so yes, the rules are lacking, but uh, it's, it's hard in, right now to sort of imagine um, uh, with such a weakened uh, CFPB um, that those rules are going to get um, any stronger. So we have a question from, question from Victor. Um, Victor asks, you know, since debt collection is an enterprise, do you have a sense of how much it affects the costs of private student loans? Is it baked into the... Um, so there are some uh, folks who have put some numbers on 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 this. Uh, I know there's some recent work that um, uh, that Charlie Eaton at UC Merced has done. Um, also Adam uh, Goldstein and, and and a number of others um, where they're where they're pricing some of this work out. Um, uh, but I don't. Uh, here, I, I, I cannot recall um, what they found, um, uh, but there is work being done on this, yes. Okay. Um, so maybe we have a question from Daniel. Um, so it looks like Daniel's looking at your website. And can you talk a little bit about sort of, you know, some of the other work that, that you're doing, um, particularly some of the cross time and, and cross, um, you know, cross country work? Oh yes. Um, so um, so last year uh, we launched a, a, a sort of a big push just on student debt, um, and the way we did it, we um, had both uh, sort of a lot of sort of key U.S. Um, people here, including um, Seth Frotman, who was the ombudsman for st for st uh, student loans at the CFPB before resigning. Uh, not. Uh, not that long before coming to our October meetings um, and now runs the Student Borrower Protection Center. Um, but we also had um, uh, people who were working in places like Chile um, and who had worked in play, uh, across Europe and had worked, um, uh, and we had sort of an author out of South Africa. Um, and, and so part of what we wanted to do is um, not just sort of um, bring all of these people from across the globe together uh, because it's intellectually stimulating, um, but to what extent does doing uh, to, does looking at another country's arrangements help you rethink your own? Um, and we saw that actively happening at, at that meeting, um, and we co-presented that with uh, the financial security program at Aspen, um, and had a, a a a very lively concluding panel with uh, Seth Frotman. Um, uh, uh, Macmillan Cotton, um, Derek Hamilton, um, and, and Ida. And so, and so, so, so the, so the, the message here is, um, if you want to, if, if you're thinking that nothing is possible and nothing can be done, uh, that means that you're not looking, um, broadly enough. Um, and so the, the network is intentionally international for that reason. Um, and as uh, Kristen will note, uh, uh, when we uh, first convened uh, three years ago, uh, there were people in that room who had never been in the room together because uh, we typically will have financial inclusion people from the US or we'll have financial inclusion people from Europe or we'll have global South actors from South Africa and India and Africa, but in the same room um, and finding commonalities uh, we, it's not something that we were, you know, accustomed to seeing. And so 
um, this is something that I think is is now picking up up, up speed. So we only have a few minutes left, and maybe just ask you to to comment on um, what would you like to see happen in in this area, like from a policy or you know, a solutions oriented um, perspective. Yeah. So from a solutions oriented perspective, um, I would like to see uh, there be. Um, uh, that we take seriously that there are huge inequities in our justice system um, in terms of how courts are dealing with debt collectors uh, and, and debtors uh, and the extent to which uh, the information available to debtors is poor. Um, I also would like us to get really serious about redesigning um, the kinds of, um, of uh of instruments we provide or tools we provide to debtors um, because design matters. Uh, and so uh, thinking that just telling people um, what they should do, um, it will sort of somehow um, empower them to do what needs to be done. Um, that's not, apparently that's not how it works. And I say apparently because when you look at the evidence, that's not what we see. Um, and so I think getting really serious about what are the kinds of uh, justice interventions uh, that allow um, debtors to uh, indeed uh, go to debt court um, and succeed um, uh, versus go to debt court, uh, walk in, not know when they're supposed to sit or when they're supposed to stand, get really um, sort of confused, get asked, well, do you owe the money? And in their sense of self-worth, say, of course, you know, I took out the loan, uh, yeah, I owe the money. I'm not a thief. Uh, and as they are affirming their sense of, self, uh, of uh, moral worth, um, they're also say, you know, sort of um, putting themselves at a disadvantage for a debt that may be so old that they could have not paid it. Um, and so there are ways that um, that we're not designing around the existing concerns and behaviors of debtors that put them at a distinct disadvantage uh, once they're going to court. And there are ways that we don't have any infrastructure for even tracking. Um, and keeping up with and making transparent um, where all these debt collection actions are happening and who's being taken to court and which neighborhoods are being hit hardest. So what's next for the Dignity and Debt Network? Oh, what's next? So the debt collection piece is going to, um, uh, it's going to uh, move into high gear um, on the U.S. side. And, and, and we are also talking with uh, colleagues in other countries um, uh, who both have concerns about debt collection and also concerns about over indebtedness. Um, and so can we take advantage of some of the good work that's being done um, here in the US on over indebtedness, both at the St. Louis Federal Reserve um, and um, at the uh, sort of the private debt group um, and sort of look at also what's happening internationally on over indebtedness um, uh, both on a human sort of with the human more of a human rights angle in the EU, uh, but also questions of debt and dignity and that are being explored in places like Brazil um, and Argent Argentina. Um, uh, the the final thing I think that we're going to have to uh, really reckon with uh, and and soon um, is just the changing nature of financial services, um, the rise in, in digitization. Um, and start to think about not how we might have the answers already, but how we might actually learn from the experiences of places like uh, like Kenya, um, where they are they are ahead um, in terms of uh, mobile lending apps, um, and they and we see that they're mixing and matching both these new digital technologies with more traditional um, practices, and some of the traditional practices are being sort of um, uh, uh, designed around for new for new apps, et cetera. And so there's so much action that's happening outside of the US um, that I that what I, I want to sort of do better about is providing a space so we can um, explore those uh, innovations. And I think the final thing I'll say is that uh, we're also working on uh, sort of uh, these new dignity de detectors using machine learning. Um, and I think that's going to be a, uh, something that hopefully will uh, in another year uh, we'll have some um, uh, prototypes. Um, I mean, we we're we're working on them now, but you know, you, you you've got to get the the things have to be valid and they've got to be reliable, and that takes a lot of time, especially 
you're trying to sort of do things like dignity. Um, and there are people like, well, you know, how do, what does the machine need to look for when it's looking for dignity? I was like, okay, that's, it's it's a challenge, and that's that's why we do it. If it were easy, you know, I I, I could just stay in bed for the easy stuff and you know tweet out. Um, so yeah, but that's probably more than you needed to know. Well, thank you so much, Fred, um, for talking with us about this really exciting work you're doing and important work that affects you know so many people, not just in the U.S. but around uh, the globe. And uh, thank you to all who tuned in and participated on YouTube Live. And uh, we really appreciate your insightful contributions and questions. We invite you to tune in live for the next session in our series a week from now, um, again, Friday at noon, where we will hear from Dr. Joni Caldoun and Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist about life during COVID-19. Uh, we really hope that you'll attend. More, informa more information is available on our website, poverty.umich.edu. So thanks again, and thanks again to you, Fred. A real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks. Go Blue.